virtually. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, just a couple quick things. For anyone who needs parking validations, um, you can get those from members of county staff at the end of the meeting. Um, any members of the community who'd like to um, sign up for public comment, there is a sign-up sheet uh, that is on the table right over there. Um, and based on what the sign-ups look like, we'll uh, allot time at the end for that. Folks, typically we get up to three minutes. Um, we may have to do a little uh, uh, clock management depending on sort of how the meeting has gone, but um, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, and I'll, I'll just say as we get started, this is always one of the um, most exciting meetings of the year as we really in earnest kick off our decision making process around this year's allocations of funding um, that the um, child care fund is hovering just below $4 million at this point. So we have a sizable amount um, of funds to distribute uh, and today's conversation um, We'll focus on sort of the, the, the first pass of reviewing scoring. I do want to just take a moment to thank um, everyone on the committee who has um, spent many hours reviewing 29 applications this year. It's one of the larger application pools we've ever had. And then members of county staff who have um, spent many, many hours uh, both helping us through the scoring process and then in the last 24 hours compiling all this information and getting it ready for today. So, um, and Carol and Marcia, great to see you both there as well. We have a, a nearly full house today, which is fantastic. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and actually get started with um, our first items of business, um, which is a review and approval of minutes from March 7th. Whenever we're ready, we'll see if there are good. Great. We have a second. We have a move to approve from Commissioner Whiteside, a second from Commissioner Moore. Uh, any uh, any discussion? All those in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. <laughs> that was almost a very exciting moment. It's rare that we, that we have a split vote on minutes. <laughs> What's that? What's that? She was trying to make sure if we were awake. We you were paying yeah. attention. Yeah. 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 Do you want to recast, or, or was that your vote? No. No. I um, I approved. Yes. Okay. I approved. Okay. okay. Yes. Sorry. That, no. Not at all. Not at all. I'm occasionally the only day vote on things <laughs> I know. Um. With that, the minutes carry and we can move forward with the rest of our agenda. Um, we'll turn things over to staff to uh, just walk us through the reference materials in terms of conflict of interest disclosures, um, applicants response to follow up um, questions and applications uh, uh, regarding or that include multi year funding requests and slots. <laughs> yeah, so um, I sent you all out. Um, these um, materials last week when I sent the um, information for this meeting and it has a list of any conflict of interest that anybody disclosed and that's just for transparency so you know who did and didn't score which applications um, and then we gave you a PDF um, easy access um, document that included all of the responses from all of the applicants those are also uploaded into the software to attach to the applications um, and then just the spreadsheet um, of the list of the applications that had information about if they were asking for multi-year funding and the number of slots that were included on any of the applications. And then also this morning, we sent you out the overall score spreadsheet that included the scores um, as they shook out after you all finished your scoring. Great, does anyone have any questions or discussion items on any of those materials? Great. Um, next up, uh, a, a conversation on prioritizing workforce development, which I can. Yes. Okay. We we uh, I I kind of took us a, down a bit of a rabbit hole at our last meeting, which I appreciate y'all indulging, but um, we did want to revisit that topic here today. And um, uh, based on conversations we've had in the last couple of years, and particularly in the last two years, really, um, there has been so much focus on. Um, the challenges related to workforce development in the early childhood space. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And one issue that comes up repeatedly again and again is um, uh, some of the specific challenges that exist for us here in Buncom County related to um, finding enough uh, BK teachers to staff at C pre K classrooms. Um, that's a licensure that's required for staffing in C pre K classrooms and requires um, specific. Uh, 
coursework and it's a degree. Many institutions in North Carolina and some in Western North Carolina offer them, but none in Buncombe County do offer that degree, except you could do it remotely from here. Um, and uh, simultaneous to that, there are a number of, of people in Buncombe County currently seeking or having recently received BK degrees who tend to do this on their own or with support from the center that they work at, um, but not in any kind of um, coordinated way where we are really trying to build a pipeline and bench of folks who are working their way through BK licensure and coming out prepared, not just with that licensure, but uh, prepared to teach in a Buncombe County classroom specifically. Um, and there are some interesting models being used in other communities that are also homes to BK programs where they have these real pipelines where people essentially do sort of public service type fellowships um, <clears throat> where in exchange for support around tuition costs, for instance, people agree to teach in a local classroom for a certain number of years. Um, all that to say, um, the proposal that I kind of wanted to float to y'all as a committee um, is that we create an ad hoc group that would take a deep dive look at this question of how we could increase the number of um, licensed BK teachers in Buncombe County and provide meaningful support to people in seeking that, um, coming out the other side with a commitment to teach here in Buncombe County um, and come forward with some recommendations around that um, that could come to this committee as a starting point and depending on the will of this committee, a next stop could be um, commission. Uh, I think this committee could also, depending on the outcome of those conversations and recommendations, make some decisions around funding allocations related to strategies around that. So um, this is an, it's one attempt, um, I think, among many that are underway in our community to sort of move forward a piece of the conversation related to that workforce development piece and a specific question about whether there's a role that Bunker County can be playing. Um, in helping to accelerate or support that process. And implicit in that, of course, is uh, would be uh, a, you know, a landscape review to understand who else is working in this space, what collaboration opportunities exist, um, where partnership opportunities might exist, and sort of how the county could best come in as a partner on the table. So that's the wind up. Um, <laughs> I'd love to take a moment and, and just hear if folks have any thoughts or ideas around that. Um, if there would be an openness or interest to creating an ad hoc committee that coming from a timing perspective, I think it would be after we complete this year's grant cycle, that would be sort of a next activity um, for, for some committee members to embark on. It seems imperative, honestly, that, that we do something like this so that we can know where, as you said, where the opportunities lie and uh, making sure that efforts aren't being duplicated um, and making sure the county is um doing what it can it seems like a very good idea very useful idea we've heard repeatedly that workforce is the issue so i agree and it seems it seems reflected in this year's grant applications as well well if you look at this year's grants i agree and it's talking to people in pre k business you know i've heard from a lot this is a big barrier that we're running into here is they can't find the teachers. Uh, and if we don't do something about it, it's going to get in our way of improving the slots of the number of classrooms. So I think it's something that we almost have to do. Unfortunately, I think compensation is the yeah. issue that underlies all of it. Right. And, um, That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> well, can we also say, I'm sorry, both Marsha and I have our hands raised here um, online, but with the wide reach that we have as, at the commission, when we can look at both the CTE programs, how can we establish and create mentorship possibilities? How can we re recruit and retain teachers of color, especially black males of color are needed in the early childhood education profession? How can we create collaborations <coughs> between AB Tech, Amos, Verner? We look at writing centers or literacy programs. How can we work with college advisors to help them better understand what the profession is and how we can draw into that? There are so many things we can do and see, but I agree it is going to take to make sure that our efforts are not stepping on someone else's toes in the community, but we should be looking at this. Marsha, I'll turn that to you. Yeah, I just want to agree that I think this is an, uh, 
an, a, a great idea that actually gets at the heart of, I think, what, the, what has been the sticking point with, with us getting to where we want to be with early childhood education. I also want to echo, um, sorry, I couldn't see who, who was saying that in person, but someone bringing up the idea of compensation. And I think that's something that this, this ad hoc group should probably look at is um, compensation within the, the, the framework of workforce development, because part of the, the weird rub is that this, this is an industry that requires you know, education and licensing, but doesn't pay like an industry that requires education and licensing, right? And so I, I actually think that those two things um, are, are part and parcel of the same, same issue that this committee could kind of take on and look at um, what, what resources we have in our community that are already trying to, to deal with that issue and how we could, um, as, a, as a group, really add, add our um, power, influence, and, and dollars, really, to, to alleviating some of that. So my only addition would be on this ad hoc committee is that I'm just a wholehearted yes, we, we do need to look at this. And if we do, kind of thinking through, um, how do we look at compensation as part of the issue of workforce development? My, my comment's very similar to what Marsha was saying and others, although um, maybe a little bit more extensive thinking through not only how do we educate and train and develop the pipeline, but looking at all the factors that are contributing to the attrition and the, you know, the, the challenge of retention. And clearly salary is probably one, two, and three. Um, but I think there are other factors that we could potentially address to help with retention. Um, and it would be great for that committee to kind of evaluate all of those factors. And I don't, we're putting a lot on this committee, I recognize, but yeah, to try to understand all the levers that we have that are, you know, to try to. Based on this conversation, maybe a better frame for this ad hoc group's work would be um, the sort of landscape, landscape assessment around the workforce development pipeline and recommendations and action steps that Buncombe County government could explore um, in terms of how to how to how to build out and, and best support that pipeline and that system. Does that feel like it captures a, maybe a more holistic way to talk about this? Yeah, and I mean, just to, I think Marsha's point or someone said that there are a lot of people looking at this right now. Right. So it's not like Book of County to start from you know zero. It's a really right. getting in conversation because I think the county is a really important partner in that conversation. Mm -hmm. So joining a conversation and kind of bringing that input back to inform the work of this committee. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been it. Thank you all so much for diving in on this conversation. Um, it, we'd love to um, maybe continue talking with staff as we move forward about when staff would feel. <laughs> Uh, most ready to support an ad hoc group's formation. From the committee's perspective, we have a very heavy April, um, and then things lighten up for us uh, until fall. So that can be a good time to kick off an ad hoc group if, if folks are willing to spend some time in those summer months working on it. And maybe this is something we could revisit um, at our May meeting as we kind of close out this grant making session. Do you need any kind of formal action about the committee to create that or not i think once we i think when we create it we, we probably michael do you think we would need to take a vote to actually create the ad hoc group i'm trying to remember if we did before or I, at some point i think that would be the way to do it okay yeah so maybe when we create it and appoint the members to it we could have a vote at that point great great so be thinking about whether that's something where you'd want to dive in and, and thank you all for helping to uh, refine the framing of that and, and the focus of that um, of that conversation. I have a question just about whether the county has gotten involved at all with the Office of Early Childhood Development, the federal organization that really has funds and help with creating a pipeline. To my knowledge, no, but that sounds like one place we should certainly explore or if anyone has more information about what that would look like. Okay. Yeah, I'll do a little research on that just because I'm curious. Okay. Or if there may be a partner in Boca County who's already tapped into that resource. Yeah. So we can help. Okay, great. Terrific. And do you think they they uh, establish a relationship directly with local governments from the federal level straight to the local government? I think they might. And they have grants and supposedly now who knows how long it will last, you know, so yeah, okay. once this administration. That too. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But worth looking into. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay, well, thanks so much for that conversation. Um, and now we get into the heart of the matter. And we'll, uh, again, with, with appreciation, turn these over to staff members who will walk us through um, the, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just looking to walk us through the spreadsheet and, and kind of kick off our conversation. Let me get this up on the screen for everybody. Okay, so this is the spreadsheet. Oh, actually, let me get to the other tab. Um, this is a spreadsheet I sent out to all of you this morning um, that just has it listed from the top score all the way down. And it has information about the amount they requested, their score, um, how many of you recommended funding, how many of you scored it. Um, and then I do want to take a moment to talk to you all about this overall composite score because we did use that last year, which took the overall score that you all give them in the software and then the percent of committee members that recommended it and average those together for their overall composite score. Um, from a staff perspective, we're recommending doing away with that this year um, and using just the overall score from the software. Um, it just adds an extra layer of of potential confusion and I can show you in this other one even in using that this scenario right here is using just the overall score and then this scenario right next to it uses the overall composite score and it doesn't change a thing um, hold on just a second Yes, hold on, let me join Zoom so that the people online can see this as well. Now everybody online can see it as well. Um, so, and Matt has joined too. So, do you want to do you want to join in the conversation? Yeah, you want to take over, or um, do you want to pop the It's okay. Um, so, I was just explaining that we're um, recommending to do away with the overall composite score and just let the overall scores um, speak for themselves because it doesn't change anything in the scenarios. It just adds an extra layer where things could get miscalculated or confused or anything. Um, staff has, um, first of all, is that something that is agreeable for the committee? Anybody yes. have any reservation about that? I agree. Okay, and so then the next thing that we would need to do is kind of talk about um, like rules that you might want to use this year for your scenarios. Um, so I pulled up the ones from last year, um, which is down here at the bottom. Last year you did it if they scored 90 to 100, you allocated 100%. And these are just starting points too. Um, 
and then 80 to 89, you did 80%, and then 75 to 79, you did 60%. Um, and again, it's just a starting point because then you did go through and reviewed and you made some tweaks to some of them. But if that is the case, um, we did create the scenario that shows you um, what would be funded as of right now. And um, then we also did one that if you wanted to fund 100% of the projects, how far down it would go. Um, and then both of these scenarios do leave a little bit of money on the table that you could allocate. Um, so we just need to find out, is this a starting point that you want? Are you interested in seeing a different starting point? Are there any certain rules that you want to implement from a starting point? I can't see it very well. So am I reading it correctly to say that if just as a line that I can wrap my thoughts around, if we were to fund everything at 100% and just focused on how much money, you know, using all of the money, we would end up fully funding down through how many Baptist church and part of Evolve Early Learning? Um, at 100%, it would be all the way 100% through Asheville Jewish Community Center. Um, and then you would have $17,000 left over to allocate to other. Which is 18 out of 29 projects. And if we use that tiered method, yeah, we're just down to row 20. Correct. And you use the child care center. You use the rest. same scenario you used last year. It would, yeah. it would at least do some funding all the way through child care center of First Presbyterian which would fund 22 of the 29 projects and you would have 7,900 over to allocate. The only thing I'm struggling with is that, I mean, and I don't know how to factor this in, some centers apply for much larger amounts right. than we last, it seemed like before they were all kind of in the general. And if we just do a percentage and some centers just, have figured out what we're doing. I don't know if that's the case, but yeah. sandbagging is what it's well, <laughs> you know, you apply for a much larger number and get funded at that percent, and it just doesn't feel equitable. So, well, and that's why, from a staff perspective, I mean, it's important for you all to understand it's just a starting point. So, if you say, okay, we want to start with scenario one, you still could go through and do any adjustments. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if there's one that's on here that you wanted to lower, you could. I mean, that's just a starting point just to get the conversations going. I agree with that. I, I, I kind of like that process from other boards of having our priorities kind of set about, we all know which programs we support being funded, whether or not they're funded at that specific amount is a completely different question. There are four or five that we could look at and probably still remain true to the answers that we gave on the the review itself without necessarily fully funding every single one at the amount that they're asking for. And some of these are also multi-year, potentially multi-year <coughs> to consider as well. That's true. Could you scroll down so we can see the cluster of groups that are just below the cutoff at scenario one? So there's a cluster that scored between we're using under under this version of scenario one, we're using 75 as the cutoff. And then there's a cluster of one, two, three, four organizations that scored between 70 and 74. Um or actually five. Child care center. Well, wait, it, with rounding that one. Yeah, you round that 76.6 goes to 75. Wait, sorry, say that again. There's four of 74.6. So if you if we're going to do whole numbers, then that one would round to 75. I think then that row 29 would also. 74. Oh, I know, but. Well, let me well, hide well what's the, column C I'll versus. See the one you want to be looking yeah, at. let me hide these okay. other ones because that's oh, the gotcha, first gotcha. Okay, okay. okay, yeah. Yeah, but column F, correct, is the number of yeses or nos, the percentage, right? That's the recommended versus non recommended, yes. Correct. Okay. How many? So, okay. So, yeah, F is the number, the percent. Of people that recommended it for funding. So we would fund 27 even though it's only at 46 percent in scenario one. When we remove, the, fund, when, we, when we take out the overall composite score, we're removing the recommended 
portion as criteria. So yes, you would not consider that. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Yep, so we would use column C. Okay, so the difference between, I, I, I guess, I, I would love to hear kind of people's reflections on whether, um, I think this is a conversation we have each year, so what the cutoff point is. I don't, I, I cannot recall whether 75 has consistently been the cutoff point for us year over year. Over year. Um, but I, I, it feels to me like there's several in that 70 to 74 point more range that had very, that um, I would want us to take a closer look at in terms of, um, and hear people's kind of reflections on whether they should be considered for funding or mixed scenario. It seems to me when you look at the scores, they're clustered very tightly through the Jewish Community Center, and then there's a three-point break. And I think that's sort of how we chose 75 last time, was there was a separation. I mean, it's small, but all the rest are very tight. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's a I haven't done the addition to see how much that is, but wonder if that's a point to look at. And then below that, maybe we do some modifications with the percentage funded. Hey, sorry to throw another like wrench in the works here, but um, I know we just hit the column about uh, percentage of yeses versus nos, but I'm having a hard time with um because even with some of the proposals that were just named in terms of where do we cut this off 75 or 76 percent i mean there are folks here with uh, or i guess i'm specifically looking at friends of mine preschool right that has a kind of if i'm reading the rows correctly um had a low yes to no ratio but still would be included among those that we fund and so i'm just not sure how you know being this being my first year that we're actually going through this process, like how do you hold both of those things? Mm -hmm. Or how have you dealt with that in the past? I have to say I hate that yes no column. Because depending upon what the what the others come in at at a total would would totally impact Yes, and I can't decide that by myself. Amen. I I agree. Agree. Okay, Derek. So I I hate the yes no call. <laughs> it's relative. It is relative. Well, but if you're making I mean, it is relative, but forty six percent. I mean, that I think that says a lot, right? I I think there are a couple of outliers in terms of the yes no's, right? It, it looks like we most of our group voted in alignment, but with um like friends of mine preschool the Asheville Museum of Science, YTL, like, I, I think I would start to have questions about, I mean, those percentages are low and indicate to me that quite a few people felt like we shouldn't fund them. So then I'd, I'd get curious about, or I would have concerns about drawing a line that allows them to get funding when so few people felt good about funding their proposal. I agree. I agree too. I mean, I you a little bit, Kit. <laughs> say that, uh, you know, when I was reading some, a proposal and it, you know, you try to say, okay, who's good at grant writing and who's not good at grant writing? And that doesn't always align with what they're doing. So when you try to read, it might be, well, they scored lower because I'm going through the criteria, but yet I say, I still want to fund this. I think it's a good program. You know, and they maybe they weren't as good at the grant writing. Well, that's an equity piece, right? right. A resource, a lack or the lack thereof, or you know, having a resource of having someone on staff that's that's written this before, having access to pay someone versus not. And so, yeah, you start to think: Am I grading how that someone that because they knew how to write this, or is it the actual reflection of what they're asking? Yeah. For me, that's how I use the yes no. Is yeah, exactly. Or score, but I think yes. So one may have had a higher score, but I couldn't know. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had, I had a similar experience. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. It's it's easy, no, but I'm just thinking if, if, they, if, if as a total, it ends up not being in the top, is there any avenue to, to go back and put that, use that yes anyway? I don't know. 
I mean, I, I it's a good problem. So the question I have, this is the first time we've used yes and no, right? We did it last year. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. 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 We, did. Yeah. we didn't use it last year? Yeah. No. It, no. no. Oh, Andrew, I'm saying we did. The yes, no? Did we use it? I think I thought we did. We did. Yeah. That's what she said. Yes. Yeah. 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 We didn't use it as a deliberative tool. We didn't use it in establishing criteria. It was decision. factored into the overall composite score that you used last year. So, but, and, the, and just to clarify one more time, if we don't use the overall composite, if we use the overall composite score, how? No change. You said no change, change. But, it, but could it change if we, as we move forward in our deliberations? Or are there no scenarios under which the overall composite would create a change? Um, so there may be more or two where it goes through a change. Uh, the one I'm looking at in particular is. All right. It seems like we were using it as a as a balancing measure, right? Like even if something was going to score low, we would still like we would still recommend to it to be funded. Like it seems like that was the intention. But someone correct me if I'm wrong. So the one I'm thinking of is um, makes. Uh, the difference here between well, so is G is in the margins. So the, the two that are yes. in the, so that group that in the seventies that we talked about earlier. Yeah, those are the ones where it may potentially have an effect, but it's I, I, mathematically we're just going to buy straight numbers, not rounding at all. No, it doesn't. Well, look at look at Southwestern under overall. If we use G. Right. So it's got a little bit higher in terms of the recommended, but on the actual score itself, it was a little bit lower. So that's why I'm saying it's in the margins there. Right. Um, and Sprouts early learning also, right? Those two, Sprouts early learning has a significant difference. Right. That would be around the school would be around at the 74, which would match Southwestern Child Development, but it's got a much higher recommendation score. Right. So that's why the overall, that's why the composite versus row score matters, because if you're not counting the recommended, that just falls less. Than. Unless you want to use it as a secondary criteria when we're starting to do the scoring. It may be, I mean, that might be something for us to consider is that it is a secondary criteria as we're thinking about what our cutoffs are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I don't, I, for me particularly, it's always the hardest part to the conversation are the groups that fall directly above and below the cutoff and making sure that we really understand what's driving those decisions. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I think we can look at, we can see several groups right here where if you include the overall composite, they land differently, even if the great majority of them don't. Yeah, the only um, caveat with that um, is if you use the overall composite, um, you are going, as you can see, let me unhide these that I, so, um, Scenario three and scenario four is based on the overall composite. Um, and you're not gonna have as, you're not gonna be able to go as far down unless you lower the thresholds a good bit. Um, because even in the scenario four, if you're applying that anything from 90 to 100 gets 100% and then you go down to 80%, well, then you cut off after two because you're out of funds. So you're- So you don't even, you have so many, well, so, so it inflates the numbers of 100. Correct. Significantly. Okay. Unless we give the record just for a weight, it will do that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We can go down rabbit holes if you want. This is a rabbit hole, yes. <laughs> I would like to ask a question. So it may be folks who've been here longer can answer, but it seems like the asks, the, the dollar amount, were um, much larger than they have been in the past. Is that correct? Like, like in a significant way. I think more, to Susan's point, more groups requested higher amounts. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. so maybe we would have had two groups requesting above three or 400,000 last year. This year we had a cluster of five. Exactly. Or so. And those, and the ones previously have been like city, county, right? Like big, burner. Yeah. 
I don't know. Somebody said when I brought that up, is that relate yeah. to multi-year? But I think the acid are up here for this year. Yes. Yeah. 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 Some of those larger so, asks are also multi-year asks, meaning yeah. if we said yes, it would. And I guess from an equity standpoint, it feels like if we go with 100% of these bigger asks, that means we have less to put into you know, other organizations. I mean, that's a strategic decision for us to make. Do we want to put a lot of money into a few organizations or a combination or? And I, think, and I think the equity question is, is really important, but it's equity among the children serve, not equity among these organizations. So I'm not as interested in spreading out the wealth to as many as absolutely possible. I'm more interested in which one of those are going to do the most good. And, you know, if there were two organizations on here and they could solve our problem, I'd give all the money to those two and disappoint a lot of people. But that's the focus to me is the... I wonder too if this is a function of the uh, salary bump that came along with COVID, and now, as I read these, mm -hmm. you know, uh, application after application after application was like, "Help me fill this gap, I, this cliff. I know I'm getting ready to fall into." And I don't know if we have any more information than we did when these folks wrote about what that situation is going to be, but it. A minimum, I think it only pushes it out a year, maybe. And there, there are people who, you know, approach that in different ways as to how to get salary uh, stabilization for their for their workforce. Either they ask for it just outright, or they put together another program that facilitated their own staff to get it. Um, it I, I meant to go back and just count the number who just ask outright for us to fund their, their their salaries. And I know there was one where they were asking for us to fund 33% of their salaries. I really worry about sustainability. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't see how it's sustainable. And I've said this for years. I don't see how we, before we know it, we're becoming operators of all mm -hmm. of these childcare centers. Well, I, I agree, but I think the scramble is reflective of what's going on with the funds drying up but no, i wonder no but i wonder have philip or susan noticed their grant requests increased as well since they're in the business of have they seen their numbers and we're evolving so i can't really speak but that would be good probably talk about it. well on our early childhood side those are not our grants are invitation only grants so it's it's, it's not a fair, you know, it doesn't give you an accurate picture. Um, yeah, the volume of grants, not the size, but the volume has increased dramatically across our entire, all of our grant programs. But I can't speak to the size of early childhood. And some of the multi-year asks were, I saw um, they were going to be asking for more each year. It wasn't, it was going to... Uh, you know, ascend instead of dropping down. There was right. so we would need to keep that in mind. Right. We'd love to hear from some voices who we haven't yet had a chance to hear from in this part of the conversation. Make sure we're getting everyone's perspective as we move forward. Carol is in the chat if somebody wants to read that. Yeah, I'm sort of in a, a loud room right now, but um, one of my thoughts is just trying to focus on methodology because I think we've put a lot of effort into reviewing the applications and looking at them and scoring them. And, you know, I think we need to decide, are we going to use the full composite score or not to start pairing down into segments as a baseline? And I... I think that's a good place to start this discussion because I think everyone will have more dialogue as we break down into one one application versus the other. But I think we need to start looking at what is the criteria that we're focusing on and, and try to move forward and agree on that composite score or not. Yeah, 
of the staff recommendations very seriously. And if they recommend it ditch in the composite, I'm, I'm saying ditch it too. And I will just say from a staff perspective, just because it didn't change who was getting funded, it just changed those percent. It was just an, it was a way to remove one factor that could lead to confusion and everything. And because in the other scenarios, you could still tweak the percents and everything, and it's still the same organizations are in that threshold. And again, if you always want to come back on the end and use the recommended percentage as a secondary criteria, you have that option. <laughs> Yeah, I second the the recommendation to to um, ditch the the composite score and and perhaps you know for the places where we see discrepancies, just having a conversation on a case by case basis. For folks who are new to the process, what we have tended to do each year is have a couple of secondary kind of criteria at play as we move forward. One of them is sort of specific knowledge or perspectives or um, details within applications like for instance is one creating new slots or not like drilling down to like which of these are actually creating new slots another is equity equity issues and i think especially given our recent conversations around um the racial disparities showing up in kindergarten readiness data and our commitments around equity making sure we have a really robust consideration and conversation around equity this year and thinking about particularly what the data is showing us about um, the kiddos in our community who are most likely to um, uh, most likely to be at the greatest level of need or where there might be the greatest opportunity um, for them to access strong programs that could be difference makers for them um, and then um, based on this conversation it sounds like that um, uh, yes no score could be another secondary kind of criteria that we use as we move forward and that's sort of in a um, partly methodologically driven and partly through organic conversation, how the committee has sort of steered the ship into port over the last couple of years and, and come up with a final list of recommendations. What is, is the yes or no question, is it, um, that's the same as the number recommended funded, right? Is that, that's the same thing? Uh, people are talking about a yes no question yeah that's, that's yeah. What they're... i can't imagine that we would want to fund anything that gets less than a majority vote i mean if if you have 15 people who are eligible to score and you get applications that have only seven six six three and two i don't see any scenario in which it would be fair to consider those so currently there's only one that's approved for 60% funding that's friends of mine free school that has below the majority threshold you're talking about. And that's yeah, 46.67%. The other is 73% higher. I've also heard several of y'all talking about you know the large asks and it's it's not anything that staff is recommending or anything, but just to let you know, one of the other grant committees, they come through and they say, okay, we have, you know, a span of requests, but we're only going, the, the biggest award amount that we're going to do is 300,000 to any one organization. As a committee, you can set that cap as you're going through this process. So you could have a ceiling or you could do it by percentage, like we're going to knock 10% off of the top, whatever. Is that okay to do on the back end? I mean, because it sounds like a good idea, but if folks were writing grants not knowing that there was a ceiling, is that I'm just asking if that creates issue. I'm not suggesting that it does. I don't it would, know. It would just be a part. You would be awarding a partial award. Yeah. Um, and then at that point, if they are awarded, just like any of the partial awards that we do, staff would go back with them and see how they would adjust their project based on the amount that they're funded. Yeah. Boy, I wish we had a sandbag factor. <laughs> that we could you know, go back and figure out which ones were sandbagging versus not. I mean, trying to trying to work with the system because I I, I know what it's like to get a grant and get a third of the money that you requested that yet the the grantor wants the same outcome, and that is it's crazy. It's that's not fair. It's really not. So not it's, for the same outcome. 
I think we have to trust the applicants. I mean, part of being a good grantor, it seems to me, is having trust in the questions that you're making grants to. So instead of ever saying somebody is sandbagging, I think you we ask them what they need, and this is what they've said. And we make the decisions based on what they've said. Well, then by that measure, we shouldn't give them percentages. I agree. They should, we should just give them a hundred percent. I think we need of to, what they've asked for. I think it's just arbitrary to take percentages or dollar amounts and just shave it. That's just not a. I, it's effective in terms of our making a decision, yeah. and it allows us then to spread out the money. But in terms target. of what we actually want to accomplish, when you cut twenty percent off, twenty percent is a lot. And um, and I mean, under I I just don't think I want to fund anything at sixty percent. I just think that's so. So then, if you look at scenario two, that's all one hundred percent funded projects, and none of those have a recommended score lower than. 87% as a secondary criteria. I mean, so then we trust the process. So where, where does that break on? We can't see all the way over there. It's Asheville Jewish Community Center. Okay, that's what I was saying before. Well, I, you know, you put so much effort into grading these things and into doing it with diligence, and then all of a sudden we say, yeah, we're going to throw some other stuff in the well, I hear that. Well, we've done some good things when we've done that. Yeah. It's just, what does it do to the integrity of the, of the scoring process? Well, I think it, I, I, my perspective is the integrity of the scoring process is one priority among many. And that at this stage, we shift into a sort of secondary phase of this, where our task as a committee is to look at the total pot available and think how to most effectively deploy it um, to address the most urgent needs and priorities we've articulated and we do the scoring in isolation of each other yeah and then this is where we come together and see what that looks like at an aggregate which may or may not be a portfolio that is most aligned with the highest best use of 3.9 million in 2023 in Buncombe county and that's i think where the discretion and the back and forth and making sure we've done our due diligence on you know, we talk about workforce developments, we talk about equity, we talk about slots. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it'll be good to dig into the totality of how, however the portfolio is showing up and saying how many new slots are being created or how many jobs are being retained or how many shuttered classrooms will be able to reopen because they can actually pay people a living wage. You know, I mean, to me that the scoring probably gestures towards a lot of that, but I don't, I, to me, it's in this part of the process where we get to dig in on that. One of the questions I had after looking at this and when we talk about multi-year funding is, has anybody run numbers yet to see what the impact would be on future years and the availability of funding? If we did, if we took the ones and, and ran the numbers, I don't, I presume y'all don't do that. We have not done that, but that is something that we can do um, because I will say, um, even in looking at this summary here, the number of recommended for multi-year funding that was on the spreadsheet that we sent out, um, some of you are really happy to award multi-year and with a, said that you wanted to award them even if the organization wasn't asking for multi-year. So that would be something that we would go back through and see how many of them really weren't asking. That might have been a user error on that one. I'm excited. That was a late night. Yeah, that was absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes, more. That is something that's happened through it. Kind of like, you can run the numbers and tell you, you know, of the ones that requested multi-year, how much it would be per year. If I check that, it was when I was looking at a basketball game. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Something happened there. Well, and, you know, the, talking about the slots, Jasmine, and that being a top priority for the county and certainly for this committee, it seemed to, in that section where they asked you well, how many slots, I mean, it was remarkable how different it was from this year to even last year yep. or the year before. Yeah. It's just like nobody's creating slots. That's because the workforce issue. Exactly. Right? They can't yeah. hire staff. So here we go. And, and hire staff. 
part because people can't get certified at our community college for whatever reason. So, I mean, it's just a circle, 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 but the slot creation, I don't know that we can well, uh, of put them, a lot of emphasis on that this year. I, I don't know whether we can or not, but a couple of proposals did include new slots. I can't. A couple did. So I, I get, like, that's a piece, that, that's a lens I'd like us to filter the final portfolio through. Like, are we funding any programs that are creating, that propose to create new slots? And I, I, I can't, look, I can't do the mental math to figure that out from this list, but I, I'd love if staff could maybe for our next meeting, create a column that says propose new slots. And the caveats that people put in. About. The, with relevant yeah. caveats, yeah. yes. Yeah, all right. The part that it, adding to that, and I hate to ask more work of the staff, but I really wasn't clear. I saw a lot of pleas like, we won't be able to maintain this without the funding. And right, so, right. You, know, you look at slot creation and slot loss, and if you created over here, but you had these really good slots that you lost, mm -hmm. is that the most effective way to deploy the dollars? And I just, it, it was hard going through this to keep track of all that, because a lot of it was just in um, the prose sections. It's no way to quantitate yeah. it. And, and in some cases, we invested in buildings, and they can't build mm -hmm. like the, the classroom. And you know, with some historical knowledge too, of thinking, oh, I'm looking at somewhere, and I go, I remember we put a lot into the capital of creation of that right. place, and if that place goes away, is you know, what's that historical investment we've made? Right. How does that factor in? There's so it's it's been multi-year, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or places that have current classrooms that if they can get a teacher and they can open immediately and pull up the waiting list. I mean, right. But yeah. those count as existing slots. Right. And, I, yeah. Right. Well, I don't remember which one it was, but one was talking about creating all these slots and I thought, have you got signed commitments from people who are going to work? Because I remember that one. It made me. Yeah. It made me think. I, I mean, I would love for that to be the case, but I was very skeptical. I mean, when we did that, the interim report that we presented to the county commission and we were talking about our results overall and how many slots didn't, didn't manifest. I mean, it was pretty, I, I'm not surprised that we're not seeing more applicants that are indicating more slots. Right. Here's the list. You guys are wanting to tease out applications that have new slots that the project would fund the opening of existing slots, the ones that would just keep the doors open, and I don't know if we money return from previous year, or, uh, I, sorry, there's a lot going on there. <laughs> I think we saw that money return over the three years, and I think that is a factor. So I think that, that, that was, the, I think those are the four things I heard as well. So we do already have some data on the slots and everything. Um, this is a spreadsheet that we shared with you all when we first got the applications, where we went through and 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 let you know if they were requesting multi year or not, which we can add definitely to that the amounts for the additional years. Um, then we have the slot information. Um, yeah, you sure do. Yeah, I got it here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we do have one. Um, we have another. Oh, and we did already have the spreadsheet that has the amount return and all, so we can make sure that you all have that going into the next meeting too, just so that you have it all in one place for the reference materials. Right. right. Could we could we also get that for the tier projects just below the cutoff under scenario one? The, the, any, in my mind, I think it's projects that scored seventy to seventy four point four, I guess. So we can kind of see who's wait a minute. Jewish community. Say that. That's almost everybody. Right. Uh, it is. I just I don't want to miss important data about I mean there's one, two, three, four providers there. And I would just like to have context around whether they any of them are creating new slots or will be shuttering classrooms, just so we have that as we move forward. Okay. I thought that the uh, Sprouts said that they would be creating new slots, a significant number, but there was yes, some concern was around that one being a startup. Yeah. So Sprouts said that 
new slots would be 80. Be how many? 80 new slots. And um, they currently have about 140. I think they were taking yeah. over an existing. They were taking over an existing. They were taking over an existing program. And I think the director became ill, and they had to pull way back. And this director that's going there, I'm familiar with her, and she's got much, so she's got her vision set. So are those new slots because they're a new organization or is that new slots mm -hmm. over the previous organization? That's what I wasn't sure. I wasn't so, sure. So if the old organization slots are going away, but they're creating new slots, are those really new slots? So no, they, current, they said that they currently have 40 students enrolled that they're taking over with the existing place and they're going to expand that for an additional 80 slots in addition to those 40 kids that's already in slots. So, so they don't have the workforce in place for it yet either. So, right. yeah. so I think for me, a couple of big questions that came to my mind as I was reading these for some of them are, do they have the workforce? Can they, you know, and the other, for some of them, and I don't remember if any of them are in the ones we're talking about, but their budget just didn't match. Like they had big deficits in their budget or they did include their organizational budget. Right. So I don't know if we look at how people scored the budget one, because that to me is like essential if they don't have a strong budget. If we don't have a consistent <clears throat> display some do it some way, some yeah. some are through their organization budget, some don't, some you know, put stuff in the right columns, others don't. I mean it's that might be a process improvement for next year. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. We're at the 130 mark. We have another hour to go in today's meeting. Um Wendy, would you mind reaching behind you for the public comment letter or two? Time check. Um, this is usually a part of the first conversation where we sort of start to pivot into kind of more specific conversations around what we we started some of it, but we'd like to ask staff for in terms of our next meeting and additional data, um, talking about different scenarios and whether there's one that the committee is sort of gravitating for as a starting point. So just invite people's thoughts and reflections on, on that as we as we move into the last hour. We have not discussed much at this point about the multi-year aspect, uh, and I guess I'm very curious how that plays into the, oh, forgive me, I thought I turned that on, uh, how that plays into the, the scenarios that we're envisioning. <laughs> Yeah, I got really aggravated with the multi-year funding issue last year, it made my head want to explode. Mm -hmm. But then when um, we went to visit AB Tech, they basically couldn't hire because they didn't get multi-year funding and they just couldn't hire anybody to run their program, which we really need. So then I had to change my opinion about multi-year funding. Um, so I don't know, I'm still boggled by it. Were they available to hire or they just couldn't hire? They, I guess, had applicants who said, I can't just do it for nine months or 12 months. And so that they had to give the money back. This was a faculty. Right. They had to hire, yeah, faculty to run the to program run, yeah. that we One needed, of their programs. We need them to run to create a pipeline. <laughs> It is a balance. I know just, I mean, you know, anybody who's run a program knows it's hard to run on year over year, year to year to year and hire people and get them security and build something. And if you commit all your money, then you're not, you know, open to the new best ideas coming up, right. people starting. So it, it's a real delicate balance or so. Mm -hmm. But I, I found myself thinking about multi-year funding for the, the partners that we have been funding every year and we put significant funds in and you see them building and you kind of say, is that really 
you know, one, if we're investing as the county's investing, do you really want to cut off that investment and take it somewhere else when then it could weaken that ability to continue to build? And two, you're putting them through this exercise every year of reapplying. But it's also you don't want to commit all your funds because you don't know what's coming. <laughs> I always see that this question. I, I hear that, like the tension about not knowing what's coming. I think that's the, that's such a valid tension. But I think, given the the context that we're in with childcare in particular, and and trying to recoup from um, or, or recover from this pandemic that we're still technically in, um, I think because we're in crisis right now, stabilization seems really important to me. So, at least from my point of view leaning towards multi-year funding for at least the organizations that we trust, um, I, I think should be our, our default. I know that we don't want to go into being operators of these of these um, programs, but I mean, we are in the middle of crisis. And so, and I think a lot of these, these centers with the workforce issue um, are at risk of losing some of their slots or not being able to use the slots that they have available because of, you know, that cliff that's coming up that we mentioned earlier um, with staff salaries, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think in general, the idea of not leaning towards multi-year funding because something new might pop along is it, it may make sense. But in this particular case, it feels really important for us to not take on that stance um, and to think a lot about stabilizing the, this, this field and this industry that we, we put so much effort into. And I think implicit in this is, is, is kind of one of the um, ongoing dilemmas that we face in this work, which is, you know, we know that this sector, that people working in the sector are chronically underpaid yeah. and systemically underpaid. And for decades, there's been this dance of, well, who's going to step in and fix that? And here we wait, is it going to be the feds? Is it going to be the Leander dollars? Is it going to be like, is it going to be the state budget? Is it going to be the state surplus? Is it going to be, you know, a corporation? And I think the, um, the story that this year's 29 applications told me above all else is that um, that is the most pressing need that our local providers are articulating without which nothing works. And that need is gonna be as present next year as it is this year. And that need being just the- Sorry, uh, salaries. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't say that part. Supplementing, essentially what we're doing is a su essentially what's being asked is supplements, mm -hmm. um, similar to what the county does for K-12 teachers in a sense. I can't remember who said it. Did you say 33%? He was talking about one of the requests. Uh, I was, okay. Yeah. And I mean, one of the notes I've written to myself is, do we want to establish a a ceiling. We're asking the state to establish a floor for something related to child care, but do we want to establish a ceiling of what we're willing to help provide? Because again, sustainability over time just makes me super nervous. So that that was one thing. Um, the number of seats is another, and I don't, I don't know if I've got enough time to be able to go back and say, well, this is what they've asked for before. This is how they actually perform. So now this is what we're asking for. And I, I mean, part of me wonders whether, I don't know, I don't know whether we need to have staff who is, you know, keeping track of some of those things. We Staff can go back and look at budgets and see you know, pretty clearly the line items that are charged to personnel expenses or admin expenses. Um, if that was something that the committee wants to look at in terms of those ranges and what's being asked for there. Well, I'm gonna do the Kit, budget can you, consistency too. Uh, Kit, I think you, you mentioned the, 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 the question about sustainability quite a bit and I'm just really curious um, you know, with the question of sustainability and what does it mean if we're doing long-term funding for these 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 um, organizations? If we don't do that, where where what's the expectation of where the funding should come from? Like, what is a, a what should a center do if they're not relying on 
funds from us in, in part to help with their sustainability. Well, for example, I know there are some centers that focus in on giving, they want to do tuition free, they want to do scholarships. I, I admire that, but you got to have a source of income for the scholarships other than the than this county fund, in my opinion. I think, you know, diversification of, of where the income is coming from is important. You got to have a, a you got to have a business plan, I guess, is what I'm suggesting in some of these cases. There is a there is a movement I'm, among some philanthropists anyway of getting rid of the sustainability question. Nonprofits hate it <laughs> question and because they have to make something up. <laughs> these are by and large nonprofit organizations and the way they sustain themselves by law is asking for money. So they can't open a thrift shop. You know, they, they don't have a for-profit model. They're never going to have a for-profit model. So I think we've got to go easy a little bit on the sustainability question, but then I'm, you know, I'm a bleeding heart. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I think I'm on the bleeding heart train too. I mean, it, especially when you think about the fact that, I, I mean, I think when you look at the inside of how, what it takes to run a child care center, I, I mean, and, and and I think you've brought, brought some of these, these challenges up, Kit, as well, is there, the, Childcare isn't a sustainable business model. It, it, so like, let's just like, let's pull out the grants, right? It just does not. So like when we talk about sustainability, um, I think it would be one thing if we're talking about funding an industry that is already in and of itself, we know is sustainable, but we already brought up at the beginning of this conversation, all the ways in which and all of the environmental factors that are pushing in on these centers that actually makes it impossible for this to be sustainable. And, and I know that there is kind of a desire to maybe not think about scholarships coming from our funds, but that's also for me a little tricky spot because the scholarships, especially for some of these institutions um, is, is how folks are diversifying their 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 clients and so when we say we would love to eliminate an achievement gap or an opportunity gap but we don't want the one be the ones to fund the, any of the solutions that you brought up for a, attending to that achievement gap or opportunity gap i don't know how fair that is especially when we're talking about the industry that we're we're like what's happening with early child care right now the 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 field is i, I mean it's it's an it's I I've been amazed at what people have been able to do with the few dollars that we've given them and the middle of the pandemic and all these achievement gaps and so it, it's just really odd I think for us to say that we have the priorities that we have as a funding committee and yet and still we don't want folks to rely on these grants too much I mean isn't the reason this whole um, grant committee created was because there was a real gap that we saw that existed in the field that wasn't being filled either by business plans or other grant opportunities, right? So I, I think it's kind of, um, I, 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 you know, I, I hear the, the concern about sustainability in the long term, but I will say I'm one of those bleeding heart philanthropists that is really in the boat of, um, if we're not sustaining them, who else is? It, I, I, there, there is not a real answer to that question and it feels nice I think to to sit and say that organizations should be sustainable without us, but that's something that just does not work in the real time conditions that child care directors are in the middle of. And I think if anything, this slew of, of applications made that I, I really thought that before we, I looked at these applications, but it became abundantly clear as I was looking at what folks were saying they were up against um, that sustainability is not going to exist outside of our grants. And so we've got to be really um, think about the practical practicalities of what folks have in terms of running their institutions right now. Um, and, and I think there was also a conversation about do we fund partial requests versus versus 100%. And I know that there was a, a concern that if we fund partially, folks can't run and, and have the same outcomes. But I guess I'm curious if staff can negotiate different outcomes based on the partial funding that we give, because at this point, I would imagine too, too that partial funding is better than nothing. Um, that it at least gets someone's, you know, that if we can actually bring our, um, what we're asking folks to do uh, or their outcomes in, into like better relationship with the amount of money they're actually granted from us, then then we can deal with the idea that we're giving partial grants at this moment. But uh, I, I don't know that I'm hearing a conversation right now that's really looking at the reality of what it takes to keep these childcare centers open. 
Well, and Marcia, I would like to just say that we remember that NC Pre-K itself, that program is a partial fund, right? It's offering 60% annually to classrooms to fund those spots. So it too does a lot with the little to make sure it spreads across, so. But then there's still a gap there that has to be made up every one of those kids. And Marcia, just to answer your question, so if, if a, a partial award is considered um, staff does go back to um, that organization and works with them to basically identify what they can still accomplish with that partial amount. So we do that before the contract is ever developed so that the contract outlines the, the renegotiated um, performance measures and outcomes and everything. And the, I would imagine that part of that is based on what they say in the application they would do if they were only partially funded. For, for me, this brings up, I, I really agree with every, everything everyone is saying, and I think it just brings up how you know, frustrated we all feel by the, um, that, you know, just that this isn't adequately funded. We're all here because we're passionate about early childhood education. And to me, it almost, it feels like, you know, there's another role besides just the this grant making to say, how are we contributing to, you know, the advocacy yeah, or, and, you know, and that's why I'm so glad you brought it up, like the, you know, federal budget, what we have is teeny, you know, here and what even in philanthropy we have is teeny compared to what it costs to really stabilize this industry and to give it, you know, the value that that our children deserve. And so just keeping that, you know, I'm also thinking about what is the, you know, what is the experiment we have here in actually raising those wages and, and what can we look at in conjunction with other communities that are also investing this way to say, show what happens when you truly invest in a living wage for, um, you know, the teachers in this space. Um, so I don't know, I guess I just wonder what else can we do besides make these grants because it's frustrating to not have the dollars to support the, this important work. I so agree with that, Sue. Finally, in front of the legislature right now, after we've worked for over 15 years to get some relief on the way the subsidy is <laughs> factored, finally, there is a proposal that a lot of people have got behind, whether it'll pass the general assembly, who knows. But at least it's on the radar. At least we do have bipartisan support from many and it's talking about finally putting a floor under counties like ours where we have not had a floor and but we've had to work our hearts out for 15 years just to get back to where it is today not necessarily be funded but at least it's on everybody's docket is there a uh, a prohibition or are there restrictions on a county's ability to lobby on particular issues at the state level? Actually, Buncombe County for the first time has retained lobbyists um, and set legislative priorities over the last year. Um, issues around early childhood ranked near the very top of the issue area list. And there's five bills currently moving in the state legislature that would in one way or another expand support for early child education that our lobbyists are sort of very diligently tracking and advocating for. So that's the vehicle, the new vehicle through which we're advocating around legislative priorities. Would there be any, I mean, not that we don't have any in front of us now, yeah. but I mean, could we fund nonprofits like, let's say, NC Child? Not mm. that I'm, I'm right. not could this that, committee but do could that? this committee award a grant mm -hmm. to NC Child for its? advocacy on a particular issue of early childhood. I don't mean I'm not yeah. I think that would I mean we'd want to I think review it, but I think the, the, the parameters of how this fund is allocated have been I think fairly broadly set and address some systemic level issues. So um, we definitely want to consult with county legal on the particulars of that and but I but I think that's something the committee could explore if there was a desire to. Okay. Thank you. That might be something to look at through the ad hoc process when we have full time here in the summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. 
What if I was thinking about sort of different scenarios that are on the table? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No, all these issues are related. Right. Well, this is why we're here in the first place. So, but um, I do want to also make sure that we can um, leave here with staff having everything they need to be preparing for the 18th and us being able to do that thinking. So, um, let's hear what the kind of mood of the committee is on on different scenarios in front of us. And again, if whatever scenario you pick, you're not you're not walking yourself in. It's just a starting point for that conversation on the 18th, where you still can, you know, play around with the different percentages or amounts or whatever you're wanting to. It's it's just to identify where you want to start that conversation. After our discussion about uh, sustainability. I focus a lot on, on kind of a slots per dollar ratio, I'm thinking about how many slots we're going to retain. Uh, that being a big variable for me at this point over creation of new facilities, new physical plants. Uh, everything I heard said we don't have staff to man the slots we've already created. Uh, so I guess I, I, I wonder, I, and I know that this was tracked, how many slots are coming out of this? And is there a way to aggregate that so we can see it? Is that, wasn't that in our interim report that you were referencing, Kip? So yeah. we have that on the slide already. And it, it was underwhelming. It was not good. <laughs> <laughs> but we, I think that's a good thing for us to look at, right? Well, while we're complicating things, Let's just complicate it a little bit more. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know about y'all, but I'm, you know, when I look at some of these that aren't specific to child care, to, to the service to children, um, I wonder if perhaps that should, there should be like a division between the two because, I, and I don't, I don't know that I really believe this. I'm just throwing it out there. Because in looking at, I mean, it's it's pretty easy to make a decision about like an on track financial type of of thing versus we've got a whole multitude of programs that are trying to supplement salary and things like that. So to me, they're related but different. And I don't know what we end up doing with it. I just wanted to point it out that I thought that in some cases. Um, and some are, you know, related to after have after school components. I almost feel like I'm seeing a, a need for a whole grid where, you know, if it, to see which components these particular requests have that would allow us to be able to look at a graphic and be able to tell it's got, you know, it's got year round all day care or it's it's creating slots or it's sustaining slots. I don't know. I'm just or it's asking for certain percentages of, of salary support. We could also do the ones that are perhaps a, a caution. Where it deals with the needs of kids that have um, special educational issues. Right. <laughs> Or infants. <laughs> or infants. Yeah. yeah, a certain age range. I don't know. I don't know how we go about it, but there are all these factors. And the geography. I mean, there's some desk. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to be talking about staffing next year and the next year because all this falls under human services. And we know there's not staff to go around, they're not in child care. They're not DSPs. They're, they're not in any of that. And the children's needs are greater than they've ever been. You can look at it every day. You can hear it from parents. So you've got to have staff that's willing to take that on. I had a Were you talking about, you said be something, were you talking about behavioral health? health? No, direct support staff that works oh. with kids. So behavioral health is another issue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're looking at all of that. And we know that this staffing issue is not going to be going away anytime soon. We've had a demographic shift. 
not just in this country, but around the world. And people are not staying in it. They go in it today and they're gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's difficult. You know, it's reading all this and looking at it and knowing what's going on all around in human services. It's I think that's key. I mean, that's why this group to really understand what are the factors. I mean, I think it's definitely salary, but are there other things that we need to be paying attention to? There are others. There are others. And I think several of the proposals I thought had really innovative, exciting components related to addressing that retention piece and support for staff and kind of acknowledging the secondary trauma that staff experience or the the perilousness that a lot of staff live with because they are so close to the margins because they're earning so little, right? And so I, I do think like a number, I mean, I just want to lift up that I think a number of providers in the community are just doing really, really innovative, creative work around how to address exactly the issues you're raising. Um, and the other thing that, that just really jumped out to me from that some of these proposals, I think, named very explicitly um, racial justice, racial equity issues, and very specific approaches and strategies to working particularly with black and brown kids. Um, and to me, both those things feel a little bit like, um, not that we haven't seen them in past cycles, but I just think we're seeing more right. providers talk more right. specifically right. and think and approach this more innovatively than we have in the past. And I, just great. I think that's a thing to recognize and, and make sure we respond to as we're moving forward. Working um, with parents, too, yeah, parents, especially on behavioral health issues, which is, yeah. it is, yeah. it's huge. We're so almost at the two o'clock mark. All, but, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, we're going to come out of here having, we need to tell, we need to share with staff the committee's um, leanings towards a scenario that will be the basis of our conversation on the 18th. Again, as, as Angela said, it doesn't confine us to that scenario, but it will just be the basis of sort of um, of, of, of how we move forward. All right, I'm throwing some out there just to, <laughs> just to get it just to get things moving. <laughs> okay, great. So I would like I would like to see us not fund anything less than 80%. 20 a 20% cut to me is huge. So if we are looking at this, so, if we, uh, no, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, in terms of 80% of the available funds, not, oh. I don't mean, I'm not looking at that percentage. I'm looking at if we decide we're going to go back and pair anybody, I don't want to give them less than 80% of what they've requested. That's um that's what I meant at least. Yeah, yeah that, that is. Yeah. Well, but are you saying Kit and I, some of the folks who would get a hundred, would you be open to bringing them down below a hundred? I'd really rather not. I'd rather everybody. I'd rather if it were me, I'd start and say we're going to take the ones that got the scores and we're going to give them a hundred percent funding. That's where I'd start. But I'm not sure that that this group will accept that. That's where I would start personally. Great. Well, thanks. Taking us to the next chapter of this conversation. <laughs> what do other folks think? 100% takes us to, according to my of the numbers, takes us to 80% with one exception. Yeah. Uh, so the actual do how many center, center, center. So well, it takes many Baptist Jewish community center, leaving out how many at 81%. Yeah, that's, so that's if what I we mean. started to think 80 and above and play with figures to include how many, that's a scenario. That's, I've heard two of you say you would like to start at least start with scenario two. Um, Marsha in the chat in the chat online has said she would recommend starting with scenario one. So. I did, but I've been convinced. So I, I'm happy to go with the group <laughs> and to scenario two. If with the addendum of, of adding in Jasmine's um, recommendation that that we make sure that folks are 
who have those more innovative approaches to racial equity or that is specifically have a have a specific approach to racial equity, regardless of how innovative it is, that we're we're highlighting them and rewarding them for that work. Well, we we ranked them on that, so we could just go through and look at the scores everybody did on equity. I like that scenario too. Plus, I mean, that, if that's the case, though. Why wouldn't we weight equity higher when we're ranking? Why would we now pull out one criteria and give it extra weight? I'm no, I hear. I'm you. saying to this suggestion. Yeah. To have to figure out, well, who's doing what and are they innovative, non innovative, blah, blah, blah. We've already ranked them on that. <clears throat> if, if that's a super important issue, and I think it's very, very important, but if that's going to be a major criteria, kind of to Jasmine's point, we've already ranked them. Let's just use the data we already have. I think I think part of it, I think someone could get a very could, could get a five on equity and get a two on everything else and mm -hmm. end up. Yeah. I don't I, yeah. I don't think that I can't articulate quite. I, I get that, matters. but that's why I'm saying that's why to pull out. So you mean just one element of an organization? I almost feel like this, like you were saying, the scores are a starting point, but I don't know that the scores fully capture. And I don't know. I don't want to go too far. You don't want to get too subjective because the biases come into play. But it's also, I think, some of the what you're seeing innovative strategies. There wasn't a, a, a criterion on innovative strategies. Like there was, you know, and there are nuances. I mean, there are nuances, right? That right. we need to look at to be able to to see the whole picture, right? That is, that just a hard number. No. It can't. But let's go, you know, I like scenario two, and let me tell you why. I agree with what Philip said. We need to think about, we're talking about slots for kids yeah. and retaining who we have. Well, when you look at from the Jewish Community Center up, most of those organizations, I'm familiar with them, and the kids that they take care of. And when you talk about equity, it's in, you know, with a lot of them. And I like it that we are giving a big percentage of them, 100%, where we are helping them. Uh, and this is what it's all about. And I think everybody knows when they apply, you know, we can't fund everybody. But we want to try to stabilize the industry in Buncombe County. And that's why, as a commissioner, I pushed for it. I wanted to see this. But I like scenario two uh, for that reason, you know, that we look, we're giving all them 100%. And I think we'll get the biggest bang for our buck. Can we also then run the math on the subsequent years for the multi-year funding to see what the impact would be? Yes. Yeah, with that group. Yeah. That seems imperative, especially with those folks that are asking for more. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, some of these numbers are very enough. big. Yeah, well, we need to look. That's another issue, though. I'm talking about this year. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, additional years, I think that's another issue we need to look at. Yeah. Oh, so, right. So we can award them their ask for this year. And even yeah. if they've asked for multi year, we don't have to. We don't have to. Right. That's correct. Because, like last year, as a committee, you didn't do any multi year funding yeah. last year. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes. You can, I mean, you can look at them on a case by case basis and determine if you want to do a multi year award or just a single year award. Got it. But yes, we can definitely add that to the spreadsheet. Um, and as of right now, I'm hearing that you want to start with scenario two. So we'll, I mean, we'll still add the information for all of the organizations. So if you want to tweak any of them, or they'll all be included in there. Of this 177 names on multi year, who who is that? Um, that is. Um, Partnership for Children and Collaborativa La Milpa. They both have one award as a multi-year. I still like scenario one because I think we need to make sure that we're going across, we're covering geographically and everything um, a greater area um, and more programs. But that's my feeling. I, I mean, I, I feel like and it could be that all oh, this was resolved when I was out of the room, which would be great. <laughs> <laughs> it did a lot of work. It was. <laughs> it was. It was. 
Oh, I had to try. Um, I, I agree with, with that concern, that sentiment. I, I almost wonder if scenario two, through the lens of what you're saying, could just slightly shift that and account for those very same things. Because I think that's where we're getting at. All of us kind of want to see some version of the exact same thing there and consider that geography, consider all of the, the secondary factors that could not possibly make their way into any evaluation, at least I would fill out. Um, that'd be a 50 question <laughs> hodgepodge. But if, if we started from scenario to go forward backwards and just say, because we got to do that for JCPC, right? And you look at, all right, there's no program that's addressing credit recovery for students. Okay, we, we shift the numbers around, we do what we have to there. But I, I think starting with at least one framework that we all can roughly coalesce around scenario two seems like we're we're all pretty much there. Is that a fair read on on that as a starting place? Even if not, like we're we, we know it's going to change. It might go down as low as eighty percent under kit scenario, but I, I could at least live with that because we we all would say, all right, we have baseline. This is what we're, what our priorities are, and we're we're not pulling the rug out from under our programs for applying a certain way with certain rules in place. If I, I'm excited to follow the where the committee was mooted. If we do do start with scenario two, one item I did want to just flag for awareness is there are three entities that would get multiple grants under this scenario. CAO would get three grants yeah. totaling about 975,000. The partnership will get two grants totaling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can't quite do the math. I think it's like 250,000 and then YWCA would get um, two grants as well. And so I, again, I just like to flag that I think that should be one of the things we yeah. think about as we move forward in yeah. conversations. And I that, agree with that. Even, even, I mean, just I'm not saying this in any specific way towards those three, but even if we looked at the ones that were just getting the multiple grants, they those three organizations under this scenario would account for approximately somewhere between a third and 40%, probably of the total pool. And I just want us to think through implications yeah. like that as well. It, it, yeah. That may be where we're going to land, but those are the kinds of patterns that I think. Um, I, th I think that's I think that's important, but I think it would have been important to put that in that if you apply for more than one, you're going to get dinged. Well, I'm not saying it's a. I, I want to push back on that. I, I think there's a difference between it being a putative ding and us doing the next step of this process. Is we have to look at the total portfolio and think about the highest best use of funds. And I don't see it. But when we went through this, we were looking at the highest and best use of funds when we gave them the scores we got. No, because we didn't have adequate information to do that. We could only assess individually what we thought. I, I put, I, I said yes to more than I then will probably end up getting funded because they met my threshold criteria. But absent other people's scoring information, I couldn't begin to engage in the level of discernment that I think we need to on this. So I think I would I would just inc invite maybe letting go of it, that it's a punitive thing that we should have flagged, but instead say a result of the scoring is that three organizations could draw as much as 35% of the total allocation of funding. But if they had known that that would have been a criteria or a discussion point, then they may not have applied for one of these two things. In which didn't... case, maybe we could, that's where those are places that we those consider are... trimming, not cutting, but maybe trimming. Maybe maybe that's where you put in, one of them gets 80% instead of 100. And I will say that any conversations that staff had with organizations, because we did, you know, the one-on-one -on -one grant consults and everything, and we did make it very clear to organizations that, you know, if you're submitting multiple applications, you're competing against yourself as well as all the other ones, and it may, I mean, it could have a negative impact, you know. What are the well, that's something that you know this committee might also want to think about for next year um is it, for several of our grant programs we do have that requirement. yeah and you know these are organizations that are also applying for many other grants through the county mm -hmm. um which is not a that shouldn't be penalized at all but it's something to consider if there should be a limit to how many applications you can submit per grant program. But if but if they're doing the right work, why would you penalize them? I mean, I know it's you don't want to think of it as a pure well, I, thing, but I mean, I think if if X organization is doing the best work in a particular area, I, I, it just seems. What I don't. You know, 
feel like I have to, when I look at, when I looked at these, I look kind of independent. I don't, I didn't, I tried to go look at websites. I tried to look at where they're serving, but I don't know. And I mean, maybe we do want to, you know, put a deep dive and all of our money is going into a certain geographic area or a certain, you know, population, but I don't, I didn't have a good sense of, you know, what percentage of our funding is going to different geographic areas? What percentage is looking at especially serving children with um, developmental and intellectual disabilities? What percent is, you know, serve kind of, how is it all laid out in the county and toward the groups? That and then really, would be a really interesting point in terms of the geography. I think it would be really interesting to your point also, Wendy. And, and, and specific populations. One other thing, I, and I'm getting my grants confused. I did actual Merchant Fund grants, 53 of them last week, and then got to do this many more. And I'm, it seemed like there were some crossover between grants and programs. I love collaboration. I want to reward collaboration. But I also want to make sure that if there is crossover and there's more than one application that deals with and provides that collaboration, I'd really like to know it. And uh, I, I did not know it at the time. So if anybody remembers one that crossed over with another one, it was dependent, maybe AB Tech, maybe it was AB Tech and Welcome Partnership for Children, or I don't know. I'll have to go back and look my notes. I think one thing we did ask that we didn't really get much data on uh, was in the results question at the very end where we said, tell us if you were funded previously, tell us about your results from your previous award. And I was highly sensitive to that because as many of you know, I have a interest in making sure that we're, we're getting the results we hope we're paying for, but very few of them answered that, very few. And to me that, I don't know how that's emphasized in the training or you know what kind of counseling they get for this, but to me, uh, you know, I, I don't know how we can, without our own biases coming in, how do we hold them accountable for what we say we're, we're we tell the public that we're funding well they all do submit their quarterly reports too which we put online that i mean if any of you have any like if you want to see historical ones or anything we can get those that actually the last couple of years are still on the website that's open for anybody to see but to try to go in there and do 29 yeah. searches uh, yeah. and but, but i mean that you know that's that's one way to do it but if we're asking them and they're not responding to us with the data that's not professional it's not okay to do. and so I, again this may be a next year thing but uh, that's a liability of this kind of funding that you you know you have to be able to show how you're intruding on these major goals that the county has. You know, when you talk about organizations that have applied for more than one, I look at community action uh, uh, opportunities. If you look at Johnson pre-K, Burton pre-K, and the toddlers, you know, that's programs that need and when you talk about diversity and we want to make sure we cover the whole community, you know, it does. I mean, when I look at the areas they in too, uh, I don't feel that they should be penalized for doing the job that we want to see done. You mean because of the geography? Is that what you're saying now? No, well, because of well, when I look at geography, if you look up there, How would they be we've penalized? covered the county with several scenarios we're fine but what i mean no with the kids they're taking care of when you go to that johnson school area i mean it's unreal when you go to birth i've been there you know and as a matter of fact i'm going back with the one of the school board representatives from the county next week but those areas these are kids that need it i mean they need the opportunity 
And I would hate to see us just take that away just because they've applied for more than one. Because we have asked them. You know, when you look at our five year plan in the county, this is what we're pushing for. And they're doing that. So that's just my five cents. No, I agree with that. I, I don't think it has to necessarily be a, a punitive factor, though, for us to, to to take inventory every year as we're refining our process to say if one group had monopolized 33% of a particular budget, that you wouldn't de facto become kingmaker and say this is the this will be the group that prevails because they have done it for a long time, will continue to do it for a long time because they've been resourced for the longest period of time. Right. That, that leads towards no programs applying in the future. That's inevitably where that heads. So I think being conscious of where we're at, and even if we don't let it change our, our decision-making, at least being aware yeah. of where people stand in that is probably the most equitable piece of that, because maybe that works its way into our criteria in the future. We say, like, we have to diversify our funds across whatever in future years, right? Let organizations know that there's a way to go about that. But I, I don't necessarily view it as punitive as much as being aware of where all the money's going. I, I know that if I were to start my own daycare center, God help me, I, I, I would be crazy. I'd be with my kids. <laughs> you have to be you have to be aware of the possibility for unintended consequences, right? Like right. things that you're not intentionally um, trying to have happen, but will be an outcome if you go in one direction. So I agree about just being cognizant and aware. Yeah, it, it's important. I'm gonna pause us and do it. check in with staff. We've we've thrown a lot under the table. Yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. of requests and ideas and considerations and analyses yeah. and um and and to thank the committee. This has felt like a fantastic conversation and um appreciate everyone showing up to it and leaning into it. Um it sounds just let me summarize and y'all can we can check, cross-check, correct me when I get wrong. It sounds like the majority of folks on the board are saying they'd like to use scenario two as a starting point with some uh, caveats or, or additional thoughts. One is that potentially that funding could be extended to include funding some folks down at the 80% level. Um, the other is we wanna have discussion around these sort of secondary criteria um, that we've identified. Um, and we wanna make sure we are um, if, uh, having, I feel like I think it, Part of what many of your comments came up to is having integrity to the process and transparency around what we're actually assessing people around this year. And that maybe we might be flagging some things for future year considerations, but that for this year, we we, made, we should make sure we assess based on what we yeah, said we would assess on. Yes, so people shouldn't be dinged. <laughs> you persuaded me. Dinged right? is a philanthropic I, term. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. For anybody yeah. doing this work, nobody should be dinged ever. Right. This yeah. Is just such important work. Yeah. Um, is there, are there other things we wanted to capture uh, relative to scenario two as a start, starting point? It seemed like we had several other I, points yeah, for staff. I, I also have captured that um, staff is going to run numbers for multi-year funding for subsequent years for those proposals included in scenario two. Um, I went from our presentation about what Kit mentioned the uh, slots created. And that captured the four yeah. fields, yeah. The, the four additional fields we wanted to have data okay. on. What are the, can we uh, sure. a few more? What are the four? Again? Uh, it is, um, I think we're at it. New slots, um, where funding would go to open existing slots, the ones that would just be keep the doors open, and then money return last three years. I don't understand the difference between two and three. Yeah. Uh, keep the doors open, basically. Um, is this money going for staffing? Is it going for other things like that? It's not necessarily going to be open to new slots. It's just to kind of keep the program going. With my reading of the conversation, now if it's different, that's fine. So there's new slots, there's maintaining the slots. I think the second one was facilities that have classrooms that they can't they can't open. currently yeah, open because they don't have workforce. Okay, that's helpful too. I think that's what how we got to yeah. okay. okay, that's a thank you. And there may be a fifth one. I was say, I had a few more on my list, but I, this might be too much. And it, I mean, this might be for next year or something, but it, it, I had that we were looking at the workforce, you know, both from ability to hire 
pay and supporting the workforce, some through education, some through having behavioral health specialists. That might be too, too deep, but there are lots of different ways to support the workforce. Maybe our subgroup can explore that. Slots, either maintaining or new. And then kind of who are we serving, ages, special populations, whether it's equity focus or IDD, and um, then geography. I don't know that we're going to be able to do that. I don't know that they, all of that would be included in their application because, you mm -hmm. know, it was very broad questions. Yeah. Um, and then even geography, you know, I've heard some mention of, well, the centers are located, but just because the center is located in East Asheville doesn't mean that somebody sure. from Leicester sure. doesn't go there, sure. you know. That's fair. And these could be things we could look, consider in the future. They were just in my mind. Right, sure. I think they're all interesting. That they are. Yeah. Uh, for staff, do you all feel like you have clear yes. guidance from us? Okay, <laughs> that's clear. a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so temp check scenario two with the all the additional discussion, pulling that data for all applicants. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we'll have that available. And that will bring us to our next meeting, which is April 18th. Again, the 1230 to 230 block here. The goal for this meeting is ambitious but achievable. Um, and it is to finalize our recommendations. Yeah, so. Um, we do have the next Tuesday, the 25th earmarked if needed. Right, and if we do utilize that, we're gonna have to confirm with county management because we also have a budget workshop simultaneously oh, yeah. that. So just flagging that. We can okay, so that just gives you more incentive. More incentive. That's <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> how difficult would it be to look, somehow electronically to look at the budgets and see how much uh, they're asking us to fund of their staff salaries? Yeah. The percentage well, salary, the thirty-three percent one. You see what I'm saying? Well, it may be hard because the but the way they fill the budget so right. so we system. could do we could easily do how much their request is of their overall organization budget, but their organization budget isn't broken down. Like on that, we no. just ask for the overall budget. We don't ask for it to be broken down for their salaries and also the organizations are so different. <clears throat> the organizational budgets, I think. Correct. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, well something that I, I think it's something for us to really because they didn't understand. understand. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So, can we provide? Can the county provide lunch at our April eighteenth meeting? Um, I'm sure we can find the funds. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll help. Yeah. We'll figure. Yeah. We'll find it. Okay. And so, be looking for an email from us. Yeah. We'll. Yeah, we'll provide lunch. Um, we'll we'll email you and let you know what the what the buffet will be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, um, before we close out today's conversation on this, is there anything else that anyone wants to put on the table or flag or express? And um, Misty, Carol, and Marsha also want to make sure y'all are included. So we'll look at the screen. I just want to thank the staff. Oh my God! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and likewise, we'd like to thank all of you for all of your time and hard work and dedication to this. It's not an easy process. Um, so we will. So stay tuned to your email, and we will see you back here in two weeks at twelve thirty. And thank you all so much for great, great conversations. Was there any public no. no. There's nobody on the list over there. Do we have anybody? Nobody. Nobody's in it. Okay. Great. Okay. 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 Okay.